Okay. Here's how you call. Okay, hello to everyone who is joining us today. Grateful to have you all join. And um, I'm just going to start out by saying we will probably end um, a little bit early. I had a little bit of a um, time zone change. I originally thought I was scheduling it at 11 a.m. my time and then the rest of the world goes and changes time on me. And uh, so I need to cut it a little short um, today. So anyways, good to see you all. Good to see you all out there. Um, do you wanna say anything about raising of the hand? So I wanna invite everybody to continue to um, make comments in the chat. You can post questions in the chat. You can also raise your hand yes. over on the side. I think there should be a button at the bottom of your Zoom. So yeah, if Lori asks, if, if Lori wants That's to- That's Ashley, say hello. hello to Ashley. If Lori wants to volunteer and she says raise a hand, I think it's under reactions and you can actually raise a hand. And yeah, we'll see if we can figure that out from there. <laughs> Uh, tech skills are not my forte. Okay, and then this is Miss Callie. She wanted to join me today, so she jumped up on my lap. So I'm going to invite you all to just begin with a little gentle process of tuning in and then see if maybe some questions come to you. I have one to begin with myself, but we'll see um, if you guys, I really want it to be a little bit live and interactive. So if you have some questions, please, please put them out there for me. But to begin, you know, really one of the keystones to myofascial release is our, whether we're giving treatment or whether we're receiving treatment, it's really about our ability to listen to what's happening in our body, to tune in and um, feel what's happening in our body and find our center. So let's all begin by taking a moment. I invite you to take a nice deep breath. And as you take that breath or keep taking breaths, as you take your breaths, I want you to pay attention to what parts of your body are actually able to receive your breath and expand. And then take a moment, continue to take a few breaths and take a moment and see what parts of your body seem unable to receive any of your breath and are not able to expand. So in general, any place in your body that can't receive your own breath is most likely restricted, has restrictions going on there. So it can be a way to hone into where are things blocked or tight or stuck on me. So take one of those places as you tune in, maybe it's a place where you feel like you can't get breath or maybe right now in this moment as you're tuning into your body, <laughs> you feel uh, some tension or some tightness, some ache or some pain. And I want you to just take a moment and tune into that place on your body and start to notice the tightness, start to notice the tension. Notice the ache and the pain. And then give yourself permission to get as close or inside of it as possible. And then allow yourself to start to, I call it, uh, decipher the pain or dissect the pain or sensations, 
the tension, the ache. Give yourself permission to start to feel some of the more subtle nuances. Maybe the angle of tightness or tension, or perhaps the thickness of the tightness or tension or the ache or the pain, whatever other sensations start to present themselves. So just give yourself permission to feel into those sensations. And as you're listening, as you're tuning in, and as you're feeling into those sensations, just see if you notice that there's also a little bit of movement that might want to start to occur. And give yourself permission to follow that movement, to sink in even a little more deeply and just feel and experience what's going on. So I invite you to continue to tune in and feel your own body and what, what, it's, what messages or what movements or what sensations you're experiencing, what it's saying to you, what it's bringing to you. Continue to feel that as um, I'm gonna share just a little bit more information and then I'm gonna actually take, so one of the things in myofascial release um, is that we say that to begin releasing, it takes 90 to 120 seconds. So when we think of 90 to 120 seconds in the big scope of things, it doesn't seem like very much time at all. It seems like hardly anything. Anybody can take 90 to 120 seconds. And that's the beginning of the release process. And a lot of times when you're just hanging out on a restriction, Literally at about that time frame, you do start to feel a melting or a softening or um, the tissue starting to release itself. Um, and so I want you to actually really experience while you're listening to your own body, pain, aches, tightness, tension, really feel what 90 to 120 seconds is because when we go to actually engage in tissue, to put pressure in tissue, to do a release, to hold our own um, stretch into a self-release position. 90 to 120 seconds actually all of a sudden becomes a pretty long period of time. And what I found is that most people hang out about 15 seconds, 10 to 20 seconds. I'm gonna let my little doggy out. She's like whining about something. So, um, so I want you to really get a feel for what that 90 to 120 seconds is like. There are times when we're asking people to tune in and just experience, just experience what's happening in your own body rather than what we're doing to them as the therapist, let them experience themselves. We're gonna see what 90 to 120 seconds really is. And today, I'll even give a little story. Today I had a treatment and I, 90 to 120 seconds was way too long for her to tune in and feel what was happening in her own body. It was too intense. And so we broke it down and literally started with 10 second intervals and then 30 second intervals. And then we build it up to 90 to 120 seconds to just give her a sense of when she's at home and on her own and her anxiety comes up what it's like to give herself permission to just allow herself to feel whatever surges are happening in her own body. So keep tuning in or tune back in if you kind of pulled out to listen to me a little bit. And I'm going to give you 30 second intervals to just feel 
what's happening in your own body. Remember to just keep listening to whatever sensation starts to reveal itself. They may change within that time period. There may be a little movement, a little push, a little reach that wants to happen and trust whatever seems to come with your body. It does not matter if you're right or wrong. There is no real right or wrong with this. It's all exploration. So if it seems like your body may want to move a certain way, just test it, try it out and see. If not, just kind of let it come back. And some of you may feel like you stay very still, but the movement is happening more internally in your body. So we're gonna play. We're gonna play a little bit here, just see what happens. So again, take a breath, tune in and listen. And I am going to tell you your first 30 second interval starting now. So that was 30 seconds. I want you to keep tuning in. I'll tell you the next 30 seconds, but just notice how that might have felt fast for some of you, but it also might have felt like an uncomfortable length of time. So we'll keep going. That's the second 30 seconds, including my talking time. So that's a full minute. And that is 90 seconds from when I first told you to start. So just kind of see, did anything shift or change in your body during that 90 seconds? Remember what we say is that it's the start of the release of the collagenous aspect of our tissue. So just a reminder, when you go in and, and provide treatments or are receiving a treatment, to give yourself enough time to allow the fascial system in your body to reach the place where releases will start to unravel, occur and unravel, all right? Okay, so take a few moments now. I'm gonna encourage you to um, ask some questions. See what comes up for you. I did have one ahead of time that I will start with while some of you are coming up with them. And if not, I'll tell you some treatment stories or we'll see if somebody wants to try doing a, a dialogue session, a session um, online. So um, one question I received was, um, sometimes, so it's a therapist asking the question. Sometimes I feel like I'm quick to say something about the tissue that I'm working with on my patient, or I form an opinion of what's going on in their body. She says, I feel like I move into judgment then as a result of this information that's coming up. And I don't know if I just need to allow myself to judge it or if that judgment is impeding what's really going on. And um, so I was clarifying by saying, would you say you are asking if you are saying something too quickly and you should let that time element marinate a little bit or more about how it affects you as a therapist and making a decision on how to proceed with treatment and if she's locking herself in kind of a tunnel vision down the wrong path. And her answer was both. <laughs> so we're gonna address both of those. 
Um, so first of all, that's kind of why I gave the exercise of the time limit to help you realize that if we even, if we make a comment about what we're feeling in the tissue, which I think is totally appropriate form of dialoguing, or if um, we're asking them a question about something that comes up, how long it might take for their system to process the question or the comment. So being patient, um, appreciating silence, I would say appreciating silence or becoming comfortable with silence is really valuable. And giving yourself the time, um, if you're receiving treatment, giving yourself that time to tune in and not feel like we have to give an answer right away, because generally that answer then comes from the intellectual space of our head. But what we're really doing in a myofascial release treatment is wanting the answers to emerge from within our body or our energy field, which is what's um, both in and surrounding our body. So give it the time, maybe. Make sure. So how can we do that if we feel like we ask a question, especially if we feel like we might be a little bit uh, anxious or hesitant about the question we're asking? Is it starts from a mindset from ourself as a therapist to be okay being wrong. Or for many, it's easier to say to be okay not being right and giving space for the person to kind of explore an element of, you know, maybe you're suggesting them to tune in, it's gonna take some time, maybe it is what you're suggesting, or maybe it's kind of a little bit of a nuance around that. So let's see if I can even give an example for that. So let's say I put my hands on somebody's legs and I'm going to begin by listening to how much pressure um, will their body receive? So how much pressure do I want to place on their legs? I'm going to begin by listening to how much pressure will their body receive? And if I put my hands on their legs and I'm tuning in or listening to the cranial sacral rhythm, what's flowing, I'm going to start really gently so that I can start to tune in and hear the rhythm. And then let's say I might start to notice either something in how they're receiving or not receiving my pressure, or maybe I'm noticing something in the flow or the non-flow of the cranial sacral rhythm. And I might make, su suggest or make a comment about that. So let's say, I'm gonna say, what are you feeling in your legs? Because it doesn't feel like I'm able to sink in very much. That's just an option. And so I'm going to need to give them some time to really see what am I feeling in my legs. And think about it, if they're not really very much aware of their legs or in their legs very much, it's gonna take them a while to get down there, to get down to that place. Now, while you're holding your hands in that place waiting for them, what can you do now as the therapist? Well, there are times I will initiate a little jiggle of movement or a little um, on-off pressure just to help them kind of feel their own legs. So it'd be like, you know, I'm going to press, press and release, press and release. But I'm not going to constantly do that. I might just do that a little bit to give them a little, a little cue, a little cue to come in and feel here. But then when I'm waiting, I'm going to come back to my body. I'm going to feel my own body. Okay, how much tension am I using in my own body? And what's, the, what's my body weight doing? Am I comfortable? Am I comfortable in my own body? Or do I need to adjust a little bit so that I can be comfortable and give the time that is necessary? It's um, enough time. It's due, it's due diligence, so to speak. <sighs> I'm gonna tune in. I'm gonna see where am I breathing? Am I holding my breath anywhere? Um, am I feeling my own legs? I'm definitely going to go to the place I'm asking them to feel. I'm going to see, am I able to feel into my own legs? Or what's happening in my legs? Am I holding tension? 
Okay, so that's, that's like an example um, of giving it the time necessary. So that's a little bit about the first question. Is she saying something too quickly? Just because they don't give you a response doesn't necessarily mean you're saying things too quickly. It's more about, are we attached to the outcome? Am I attached to my patient getting what I think they should get? That attachment is what will most likely trip you up. So think of yourself in terms, when you're a the therapist, think of yourself in terms of you're offering, you're making an offering, you're offering something, whether it's in the form of touch and pressure or pull, or whether it's in the form of a question or a comment, you're making an offering and it's really up to them if they receive it or how they receive it. And they may need some time to make that choice or to see what's happening with that choice. And so when it's an offering, really it's not about you have to take this. It's about, let's see how you work with this. How does this work with you? And sometimes I will purposely even make a suggestion that I'm not experiencing just to give them some contrast. So I might say, is it more like, let me see if I can give a specific example. So let's say, let's go back to the legs and let's say, um, I say, does it feel like you're really able to receive my pressure deeply? Maybe they say, yes, I feel like I'm really receiving your pressure deeply. And in my head, I'm going, they're not, they're not, there's no give. It's stiff. It's hard. There's no give here. And I might say, does it feel like you're trying to keep me from coming into that space? No, it feels like I'm really receiving you into that space. Okay, great, let's go with that. That's their perception. Wasn't totally my perception. But again, as the therapist, the last session we talked about therapeutic artistry, there is no right or wrong way. So you have the option as the therapist, um, you have the option of saying, okay, let's go with really moving into receiving my pressure even more deeply now and see what that feels like for you. And, and what does that receiving this pressure actually feel like for you? Or if you really feel like mm, it's hard and stiff and there's really no receptivity, you might suggest to them again, make an offering you're suggesting. Feels to me from my perception that there's some stiffness or there's some blockage to receiving. Do you have any sense of that yourself? And then give them the time to reflect on it again and see, maybe they'll go, maybe, or maybe they'll say, no, I really feel like I'm receiving. Okay, so do you need to get into an argument with them of who's right and who's wrong? <laughs> From my perspective, I would say don't engage in an argument. Just see where that takes you next on the pathway to flow. So I wouldn't stay attached to what you think is happening in their body. And keep in mind that it's their body and it's their treatment session and you are there offering facilitation for it. All right, now, do we have some questions coming in around that? One question in the chat. All right, so can you read it to me maybe? I'm, I'm gonna, mm -hmm. is it about that or something different? Mm -hmm. Okay, so now I'm going to, so we see the question in the chat. Thank you very much. We're gonna get to that, but I'm gonna answer the second part was, um, well, actually it kind of did, or more about how it affects you, you, the therapist, and how you proceed with treatment if it takes you down the wrong path. So actually, I really kind of answered that question <laughs> from both ways, to give them the time, Again, it's therapeutic artistry about whether you take their answer and go down that pathway, or you share with them your perception and see where that takes you. But just letting go of the need uh, to be right about it and giving some space for exploration. That's my recommendation. Okay, would you like to read the question? Yeah. Okay, you wanna be on camera? 
Okay, so Ashley's going to read the question because I'm getting old and can't see well. <laughs> this is from Julia Snyder. It says, uh, everybody can see it anyway. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I am in massage school right now. We are being taught a variety of myofascial techniques, which are site specific. Among those areas include calves, feet, forearms, etc. It seems like these techniques are worthwhile since I do not recall learning such techniques when studying with John Barnes. I'm curious if your video includes these. Uh -huh. Okay, okay, that's a pretty simple question actually. Um, let's see, my video, the online um, DVD of uh, my officially released technique training from a feminine perspective, um, pretty much covers the um, cross hand release and arm and leg pull. It does, it does cover soft tissue mobilization techniques, but not specific to different body parts. I demonstrate the technique and then I encourage you to try that on different body parts, but it's not as specific to each of these segments of the body as it sounds like you're um, making mention of. Cross hand release, I give a demonstration of how to do a cross hand release and then show you all of the different ways you can use that on the body. I shouldn't say all of the different ways, many, many different ways to give you the idea that any of these techniques can be used anywhere in the body and in John Barnes and the way I teach myofascial release, which is based on the foundation of his training. Um, it's really about you take a technique and you begin by applying it in the steps that, as they're taught. And then you really listen to the patient's body and you might need to modify that technique a little bit. Um, but we all have to start somewhere. And so learning the structure of a technique is incredibly valuable. And I would say you can take any of those instructions and use them on any different part of your body um, that you are needing. So specific techniques into the feet and the calves that you were mentioning is definitely valuable. They're all valuable, you know. Bringing, learning how to bring our touch into someone else's body is really the essence of myofascial release. The techniques are the structure that provides you with the beginning of that, but it's how we apply the techniques that is really the magic and the art. It's really the art behind developing your mastery with this work. And so really along those lines, um, I would like to also uh, announce one of my programs, which is the Clinical Skills Intensive. And it's really where you come and work with me in a small group as if we were applying treatment. So we learn not just like in a seminar setting or in a school, the steps of, of a technique, but you learn how to apply that technique to someone in a treatment session. And it's conducted where there's four to six of you that all come together at the same time and we all treat each other. So, and then you're, I'm putting my hands on top of you. You can put your hands on top of me. I'm kind of like talking through what I'm experiencing so that you can kind of get a sense of what's happening in my mind and what I'm looking for. And um, we just practice how to take that touch to a much deeper level. And I already have a couple of people signed up. We're looking to do one in February in Sedona. So if you have any interest in joining us for that, um, please reach out, let us know. Um, perhaps we'll also send some further information out about that. But we still have some spaces for a few more of you to join and we would love to have you join. It's a really powerful program and you get yourself treated as well as then learning how to apply it more specifically or more artistically, more masterfully uh, with your patients and clients. Okay, thank you for that question. Is there any others? Okay, so Ashley's gonna read the next one for me. It says, I find it hard to complete my sessions on time because I end up mm. maintaining some holds for so long. Mm. Any suggestions for ending on time yet providing a productive session? Okay. 
That is truly an excellent question about how do we develop our artistry in a treatment session while we're trying to hold these places. Yes, I do have some suggestions for that. And I think that is a challenge. How many of you, maybe raise your hand, show, show, show of hands. How many of you often feel like you're running out of time and you could keep going and go on and on? So the first thing I'm gonna suggest is offer longer treatment sessions as an option for people. 90 minutes, two hours, they're great. It's a great length of time. I've recently done three and four hours. I thought four was too much and that the body starts to lose its ability to make change in those long sessions. But I had somebody who had a significant amount of <laughs> endurance and wanted the long sessions. So just make it an offering. Of course, that's a cost issue also. Um, and you can keep your cost at the hour rate and double it or at a certain point, like if it's an hour and a half or a two hour session or a three hour session, maybe they get a little cheaper for each hour. There's those options. Okay, but actually, let's say you're doing this half hour, an hour treatment time. I would suggest you ask the person that sh that's coming, is there a particular place that they're wanting addressed? And maybe start with that. And then, um, that's not always where we start. That's just an option, to, but to make sure that you're getting those places that they really want addressed, address, maybe start with those. And then in between some of your long holds, you might want to do a little bit of rebounding to get some fluid flowing throughout the whole body. Or perhaps let's just say we're going to do the chest. We're doing a long time on the chest. Maybe we go to one pec or the other pec or under the clavicle a little bit. But then when you're done, do some stroking down the arm, cross the chest, get both arms together and down the body and down the legs because that gives the body a felt sense of being touched and addressed throughout the whole body even though we're not holding all of that for the three to five, eight to 10 minutes, 15 minutes, however long that you're, as long as the tissue is still unraveling, things are happening and keep in mind that even though your hands might be in one place on their body, um, that's your handle into their whole fascial system. Or I like to say that's your handle into their whole universe. And so because of the tensegrity model, which says that we apply pressure or traction in one part of the body via the fascial web, it can reach any other place in the body. So even though your hands are only touching one place in the body, they might be experiencing sensations, releases, movements in other parts of their body. Maybe if it was the chest, maybe they're feeling it down into their back. Maybe they're feeling it down into their arm, up in their head. Maybe they're feeling it down into their big toe. So keep in mind that they may be feeling more of an expansiveness throughout their whole body, even though your hands are stationary in one place. Now with that in mind, keeping, a, keeping an awareness that wherever you're touching them, you're not just working on that specific tissue. That's your handle into their whole system. So, um, Allow, wherever you're holding, allow an awareness of embracing their whole body, even though you're not moving your hands and touching their whole body. I hope that that makes some form of sense. It's kind of like your mind is including or embracing or your energy field is like embracing the whole of their body. But in between, your holds, give some stroke. You don't have to put lotion or oil on, I'm not talking about that. Just, just a stroke down through other parts of their body and it gives a little feeling of integration. And it might feel like, okay, their whole body is being touched even though you're not performing release holds on their whole body. And then you just also say to them verbally that sometimes we're going to be just working on uh, specific places in your body to see if we can get into some of the holding patterns or the restrictions that are hanging out in those parts of the body. And that's just an aspect of myofascial release. It is actually a different application than massage, which we tend to uh, work all the areas of the body. 
Okay, so hope that, hopefully that gives you some ideas with how to, how to do that. And also the other thing I would say is put in your own mind. So let's say I'm doing a half hour or I have an hour, um, hour might be more standard uh, session. I'm gonna put in my own mind, instead of feeling like, ah, I don't have enough time to do everything I need to do, we can't fix or heal the body all, all in an hour. Put in your own mind that whatever needs to happen for this hour of time or for this treatment session of time, whatever needs to happen, allow that to happen. Because there is also the case where people can be over stimulated and it's too much for them and then their body starts to shut down. So just kind of say, say your own little intention or prayer that whatever time you have is the perfect amount of time to do what needs to happen for this session. Okay. How are we doing on time? Any other questions showing up? Okay. All right. Uh, Ashley, I'll give it to you. <laughs> this is a I'm an MFR client and recipient patient. Okay, patient. great. And, and because of the pandemic and my own immunodeficiency, uh, cannot receive treatment from practitioners. Mm -hmm. Can you please speak about self-release techniques or reference materials? I've attended Barnes's self-healing seminar, but it was not as much about takeaways for self-treatment as it was about the experience in the moment. I'm still looking to tr train myself releases. Okay. Okay. That is a beautiful question. And I definitely appreciate that. And I really strongly encourage everybody to do some of your own self treatment releases. So one of the major things in the myofascial release world is using a small theraball. And I don't have one here handy to show you. But I think most of us know it's a, like a three to five inch rubber ball that you can put on different places in your body and you just want to sustain pressure into those and allow your body to melt as much as possible over the theraball. You can use tennis balls, you can use lacrosse balls, you can use any kind of a substance that feels like you can sink your body into it comfortably and put your weight into it. There are so many treatment self-treatment tools. There are things called the Nola Rolla, which is a hard wooden roller that um, you can apply pressure to. For some people that works great, usually if you're a little meatier and thicker in your tissue, for some people that's too hard. There are things called a, um, a roll away, a lovely myofascial release therapist, Becky Mitchell, hello, shout out to Becky, has created these and they're a softer, it's a little wooden dowel with some kind of foam or cushion around it that she wraps up and it's a softer version. There's a device that I use a lot called the Orbi and it's two little racquetballs in a neoprene sack. You could put two tennis balls in a tube sock and tie it up on each end and reproduce it that way. Um, there's the Theracane, somebody mentioned it the last time we were on the call. There's all kinds of foam rollers and roller devices. Um, a shout out to another myofascial release therapist Lori Legatsky teaches these lovely classes on Zoom online called the Fashionator. And it's a plastic tube covered with some kind of a material that creates a little traction stretch. And she takes us through on Zoom, rolling it out and sinking into it on our whole body. And so there are, I think there's a lot, a lot online, a lot on YouTube, a lot. Um, I think I saw something on Instagram the other day, I don't know what it was, that just has some self stretching um, components also, or gives you ideas. For me, it's nice to be supported by a group. I don't do as much self treatment when it's just me for myself as when I'm in a class, like a yoga class or the fascinator class or a foam roller class, a so self, self treatment theraball class, the group support and a leader talking me through it really helps me stay more focused. That's, that's how it works for me. When you are, um, and I also, I also offer not, a, not so much as, I offer an audio meditation. Is that still offered for free? I think it's a blog. I think there's a blog. If you go on my website, there's a blog, audio meditation, and I think it's still up for free. <laughs> um, so get it quick before we change our mind on that. <laughs> um, it is a guided meditation 
meditation. It is designed to help talk you into coming in and feeling your body. Those, those tuning into the breath in the beginning is kind of a beginning of that. I take you on a journey through your whole body to feel into your body. I take you on exercises where you contract your body and then you relax your body to help bring some tone and attention. And then how to start to listen to how your body may want to move to take you into self unwinding. So it's, a, it's, it's not huge around the self unwinding, but there is some guidance to that. Um, so that's an option. Um, you know, get with somebody. There's many, many people. I do some sessions online now. Um, I know there's some other therapists that are doing some sessions online. It helps to have somebody, even visually, if their hands can't touch your body, visually kind of guide you through the stretching. We can often see body mechanics where you might need support um, to be able to sustain some of your own stretching. There's many, many ways to um, do your own self-treatment. I would put on some nice gentle music that you really can give yourself that space, create a space and a time limit maybe, and um, see if you can really listen to what's happening inside. See if you can appreciate your own body I think we tend to spend more time with ourselves when we're appreciating our body versus when we are approaching it from the mindset of, I've got to get rid of this restriction, or I've got to try and spend time with myself to get rid of my pain. I'm not as attracted to go and spend time with myself from that approach as I am with, all right, let's just see what's happening in my own body today. Let's see if I can connect. It's through the connection that things are going to shift and, and change for you. So I definitely encourage you to do what you can. Reach out to someone. If you've had a therapist before, reach out to them. See if they can do something with you on, online on Zoom. Or if you want, I welcome, welcome you to um, give me a call. And I'd be happy to see if I can give you some guidance and direction along those lines as well. Anything else? I do have another question. Okay. Someone was talking about their mom and their the balance in the pelvis. So another person asked the question. Um, I have some clients who are very, very flexible and also pretty strong. I and they get their pelvis balanced for a while, but then it will go out of alignment again. Is there anything you would suggest to help the work last longer for them? I usually have them look into PT, but is there anything we can do to help? help them maintain the alignment. Okay, that's, a, that's also a lot, so many. So let me just say, um, we can balance our, anybody's pelvis, our own pelvis, our patient's client's pelvis, it's going to unbalance again. That's called life. <laughs> so yes, that is an aspect of life. We're gonna get unbalanced. However, there's a few things. There are some specific stretches that they can do the pelvic wedges, they can do themselves at home. That's another self-treatment aspect that you can get your own wedges. Um, you can buy the nice wedges, which I do recommend. I do think it's worth spending the money on, but you can also put um, socks or a washcloth in a high top tennis shoe and turn it over and that can be a wedge for you. And you can place that under your pelvis. So you would need to learn in what, in what way, or you would need to teach in what way that they need to apply those tennis shoes as wedges or the actual wedges to use. That can help a lot for hanging out on that at home and then doing their own little pelvic alignment release stretch um, with an adductor squeeze can also help, but they need to do that on their own at home. However, the other aspect is Pelvic imbalances do not always occur at the level of the pelvis. So do you understand what I mean by that? That means that a pelvic imbalance might be coming from restrictions up in the temporal bones. It might be coming from restrictions at the suboccipital or C2, C3 area. It might be coming from some kind of a twist in the sternum or the rib cage. And if you have an awareness of the chakra system, it might be the energy of the heart chakra is really where the holding pattern is. 
and it keeps tripping out the pelvis. Or it could be that there's some internal, internal restrictions that need to be addressed and that keep pulling the pelvis out of alignment. Or it could be the imbalances in the legs. We all have imbalances in our legs and that can be what's, can, so you put the bell, pelvis back in alignment and then they get up and they walk and the imbalances in the legs are actually what's pulling it out. So it's just a process of continuing to unravel, um, finding the restrictions. If there is something that's constantly always coming back, I would look beyond the pelvis first. I would look um, like at the rib cage or higher up or lower in the legs. Um, and then just see if you can help them start to feel into the holding pattern that is occurring that gets tripped up again as they engage back in life. So something needs to be taken a little bit deeper or looked at a, from a little more expansive view. And that is common, really common that that happens. So keep in mind again, just a reminder, I know that you know it when I say it, but a reminder that our pain and problems are not necessarily occurring at the level in our body that we're experiencing them. So it's this, what we just said about the pelvis, might be the same thing with a headache. I get recurring headaches. I don't, but let's say somebody says that they get recurring headaches when your patients. It's not just about treating the head. And that's why there's a recurring headache is because maybe that's all that's been addressed is what's going on at the level of the head. It's, everything's connected to everything else. And so there's probably something going on below the level of the head that is asking to be, um, that is needing attention, really it's needing attention, asking to be addressed. Okay, where are we at? We're at 12.47. So those were great questions. Um, we didn't get a chance to do a practice session of a, like a long distance or a dialoguing like we did last time. I did have many requests to perhaps um, teach an online dialoguing class. And so I am also contemplating that. If, um, there, if you do have an interest in that, uh, definitely do that raise your hand thing <laughs> or send me a message or send me an email um, to encourage me because <laughs> I don't really like to put classes together that nobody wants to attend. Um, but if that's something that you're, you'd be interested in, I, I think I will do this again next month in December, and maybe I will make sure that there's time to do some of those examples again, like we did last time. People seem to like that a lot. Um, and so, yeah, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna cut off a little bit early today. Was there any other last final question that's popping up or that you um, noticed? Someone asked, Quick. is there any good videos or books? but she didn't say what topic. Yeah, well, maybe it was about the self-treatment. She wanted some videos or books about self-treatment. There's many, there's many. <laughs> I don't have any specific to tell you. I'm happy to send out the um, information on the Fashionator class that I mentioned. Um, if I come up with things, I'll send them out in an email. I'll keep, keep, you can keep sending, sending me questions also, and that gives me some things to put in my newsletters to you all. Hopefully you read them. <laughs> <laughs> Woo -hoo! Okay, so I send you off with lots of love. Um, I encourage you to explore your body uh, and have fun whether you are self-treating or whether you are providing treatment for somebody else. Allow yourself to have an element of fun with that. Not so much giddy glitty that you don't get into the serious necessary work that needs to happen, but from my perspective, that's also fun. It's just a different type of fun. <laughs> so many blessings to you all. Um, grateful week before Thanksgiving. So I'm very grateful to you all. And I wish you all a very happy Thanksgiving. So I will let you know about next month's class. Take care. Yeah. Okay, leave. Okay. Have a beautiful day. And...